Let's talk today about when and how to treat osteoporosis. Uh, we all know about osteoporosis. You've learned from the stalwarts what it is. Help us and what are its uh, fallacies. Uh, let's now look at the components of fracture risk. See, osteoporosis, while it is diagnosed by showing, demonstrating a low bone density, it is not exactly synonymous because ultimately we are trying to look at things that will determine fracture risk, factors that will influence fracture risk. And these factors, while bone density remains the most important factor and the best predictor of fracture risk, are, is not only bone density dependent. So there are non-BMD risk factors also, which are very important. So, for example, there are skeletal risk factors, of course, low BMD, but previous fracture. A previous fracture and a family history of osteoporosis can drive you towards treatment, even if the bone density is normal or just osteopenic. So remember... If someone has had a conus fracture, a vertebral fracture, or a hip fracture, any of those, any of those if somebody has had, then that means that person is at greater risk of getting a subsequent fracture. And therefore, this is important to remember that we don't take bone density at face value. You will interpret it like has been explained in the earlier talks, but you will also look at the, uh, the accompanying risk factors. So... The other way, the important part which we often completely forget is other non-skeletal risk factors, which means not related to bone, but those that increase our risk of falling. Remember, osteoporosis occurs in old age. And in older people, they may be diabetic, they may be hypertensive, they may have had a stroke, poor eyesight, poor hearing, poor balance and muscle weakness all can increase the risk of falling. So all these factors combined predict fractures. They are important for determining fracture risk. And unless we correct, take a holistic view, just by prescribing a pill for low bone density, we will not be able to treat our patients properly. The important thing for, for orthopedic surgeons uh, to remember, which they of course do, but still I'm reminding you, is the fact that if someone comes with an undiagnosed or asymptomatic or morphometric vertebral fracture, the chances of the person getting another fracture is very high. So remember, almost 20% people will fracture again in the coming year, and I'm not showing data on hip fracture, but it's very, very important that people who've had a hip fracture are likely to get other hip fractures very soon. And I think this is very important. And this is sometimes when the risk is very high. And this is called risk of imminent fracture. Like, this is like, you, you're very, very likely to get a fracture if you've just had a major fracture or two fractures. So the third one and the second one is going to follow very soon. And therefore, that period is now considered a, a sort of very high risk period and often warrants more aggressive therapy. So uh, this, this imminent risk of fracture uh, is, is important uh, to understand because not all fracture risk is the same. Someone who's had a Coley's fracture 10 years ago versus somebody who's had recently a hip fracture, their fracture risks are different and they need more aggressive fracture, um, fracture prevention. So before we go ahead uh, further, I'll quickly take you through the bone remodeling cycle. If it's not already been done, Basically, this is the resting state of the bone. When we talk of activation, the first step that happens is activation, which is the activation of osteoclasts, which produce bone desorption over a period of 7 to 10 days. So they dig a pit in the bone. This is important to understand that the first step is osteoclastic resorption. And why should that be? Why should it first be resorption and then formation? Because there is a logic to osteoclastic resorption. These are the macro damaged areas of the bone which are chewed up by the osteoclast and then subsequently formation takes place. So you fill up those pits, uh, those, those excavated areas with fresh cement, with fresh bone. As usual, destroying is easier than building. And while you take 7 to 10 days to dig a pit, the osteoclast, the osteoblasts take the bone forming cells, osteoblasts, they take 10 weeks to fill it up. 
So if there is a micro crack within our bone, within our skeleton, which is always there, and as we age, it increases more and more, those micro cracks are up, excavated, scooped out by osteoclasts over a period of a week, 10 days, and then filled up by osteoclasts with fresh, healthy bone over the next 10, 12 weeks. Now, when we have osteoporosis, there has to be a problem either of bone formation or bone resorption. So either the, the, the uh, osteoclasts are chewing up too much bone. If they chew up too much bone, which, which the osteoclasts are not capable of filling up, then that is the reason for osteoporosis and weak bones. Or if the osteoclasts are chewing up what they should do normally, but the osteoblasts, the osteoblasts are actually not able to fill up to the extent that we want. That is a, also a reason for osteoporosis. Now, uh, coming straight to the uh, practical part, the T-score for BMD uh, is assessed by DXA, the femoral neck or spine, as you know very well. And if it's below minus 2.5, that is diagnosed as osteoporosis, a, a de bone density diagnosis of osteoporosis. Now, what do we do? What is the objective of treatment? I don't care what my bone density is. I don't really care what my bone density becomes. I don't care if the medicine I take changes my bone density. What I want is a reduction in my fracture risk. Right? It's like saying, I treat cholesterol because I want to reduce heart attacks. If it's going to have no impact on heart attacks, I don't really care about cholesterol. So the end point here is fracture. And our goal of treatment of osteoporosis is to reduce the likelihood of fragility fractures. How can you do that? By skeletal measures, like that is by improving the strength of the skeleton, but also by reducing the risk of fall. So don't forget the second part. Sometimes we tend to forget those things, practical things. We get so enamored by fancy medication and protocols that we forget that reducing fall risk is a very, very important way to, to reduce the risk of fractures. If you don't fall, you don't break a bone. So these are the international indications for bone density testing. And we, have, we are in the process of bringing out the ISBMR guidelines. Dr. Badada is here. Uh, we are reducing the probable uh, age here because uh, our age at fracture is lower, whether that is simply because we don't have enough uh, lifespan or whether uh, it is truly because we're getting fractures at an earlier age remains to be seen. But we think that all women over 60 should have a bone density, the Western criteria, because that is published criteria I've written here 65. Uh, all most postmenopausal women who have a history of fracture with, with any suspicion on x-ray or uh, on long-term glucocorticoid therapy more than three months or those who have risk factors. So if you're above 50 and not yet 60, which means postmenopausal women, you would still do a bone density, a very low body weight, long-term steroid therapy, family history of fracture. Early menopause, this whole thing is based on menopause. If menopause is at 35, then it's a different story. Current smoking, excessive alcohol consumption. So all these are reasons for you to get a bone density done. Very often I've seen health check programs, completely healthy women at the age of, or even men at the age of 40, they go for executive health checks and they get a bone density. Now, doing a bone density at that point is very hard to interpret. We don't know what it means. We don't know if the person has no other major risk. Why should we, we be doing a bone density? Because the data of interpreting bone density alone at that stage is, is very wishy-washy. And we would not know whether to treat or not to treat. And if it shows, let's say, minus 2.5, the whole family descends on you and says, this is a problem you have to treat. And I'm sure Dr. Patada has dealt with that nicely so that you are aware that, that uh, what exactly should be done in young people with osteoporosis. But here we are talking about, you know, uh, diagnosed by chance osteoporosis in people who don't really require a bone density. So interpreting a bone density in a 40-year-old is very difficult. So unless there is a clinical reason, don't do a bone density in, in, in such people. Do it in women after menopause if they have additional risk or do it in women over 60 and in probably men over 65. You can even say 60 and 55, but not like 40, 40. Okay. So the idea is that we do optimal utilization of the test. But the idea is also that we don't get misled by, by readings which don't lead us anywhere. So who should be treated? Uh, quite clearly, the first is recent history of fracture. In the last two years, no confusion. 
T score of less than 2.5 or a FRAX predicted fracture risk of tenure, a fracture risk of 20% or 3% for hip fracture. Now, this 20 and 3% is very arbitrary. It is not based on science. Why 20%? Why not 15? Why not 25? This is just what the Americans do or the Canadians do, but it is not necessarily applicable to our country. We may want to treat at a lower fracture risk. We may want not to treat at this fracture risk. So that can vary. But let's take one paradigm that is established by, uh, by the West and let's look at that. And this is the FRAX risk assessment tool. We're very easy. It's free and you can download it on your phone or wherever. And for all your patients, you can use FRAX assessment tool. Uh, for India, you can see the Indian flag there. Uh, and the important risk factor there, previous fracture, parental history of hip fracture, current smoking, glucocorticoids, rheumatoid arthritis, excessive alcohol. And of course, diabetes should be there, but it's not. But to use uh, diabetes, you can use rheumatoid arthritis as a surrogate. So you instead of rheumatoid arthritis, someone has diabetes, you take a diabetes because people with diabetes have a much greater risk of fracture. So having said that, we can use FRAX. Some people use it, some people don't. The problem with the FRAX is it tends to slightly underestimate the risk of fracture in Indians probably. And it is based largely on Singapore Indians, uh, Indians living in Singapore, who may not truly reflect always the whole spectrum of uh, Indians uh, that, that we are used to seeing. There's a lot of data on, on, on bone density in Indians. Uh, there is also very recent data from, from uh, the Chandigarh team. Uh, but uh, it's still not like in a software format and you really have to follow the FRAX assessment tool at the moment, recognizing that it may slightly underpredict fracture. So we tried to look at the assessment of FRAX and we won't bore you. This is slightly technical, this paper. We can let it be. But you can calculate FRAX for major osteoporotic fracture and uh, FRAX for hip fracture using clinical risk factors without a BMD. After you've done that, if you fall in high risk, you, you can treat even without doing a bone density. If you're in low risk, you need nothing. But if you, if you fall in between, then you will need a bone density and a full workup. Right? So this is just a paradigm. You can go into the model. The paper is available. Uh, we are not saying this is a final recommendation for India. And there, is, there are papers from Bellore also which are suggesting that FRAX does work well in India. But the fact is that the, the, there may be quantitative differences in the risk prediction using FRAX in India, it, which is not as solid as it is for countries that have really good data, uh, like the, the Scandinavian countries or even the US or UK. So who should we treat? As I said, if you use clinical risk factors, uh, which are the same ones that are listed on the FRAX thing. Uh, if you have high probability, you will treat. If you have intermediate, you do bone density. If you have low, then you don't treat. So if someone clearly is absolutely fit and fine, even if the bone density does show, because we are going the other way, normally we're getting the bone density and then deciding treatment. So if someone has a fracture already, an osteoporotic or a fragility fracture, then you will treat, you, you still could do a bone density for follow-up and all wrong. You should do it if it's available. But you don't need to need that to decide your treatment. Okay? So that is helpful in long term. It's documentation. It helps in the long term follow-up. But it doesn't necessarily uh, change your decision to treat. If on the other hand, someone is completely healthy, doesn't have family history, has a good calcium vitamin D, you know, uh, has no reason to be falling, you would consider that person as a low risk and you would probably not necessarily venture to do a bone density. Even if you've done a bone density, if the bone density is marginal, borderline, etc., you may say, I'm not going to treat this person. You know, I'm going to really wait for the bone density to go down because that seems to be the only risk factor. Everything else looks okay. And if you're intermediate, then you would say, well, I would do a bone density when I'm not sure. And then you can definitely decide on the basis of a bone density. Now, this may sound confusing. For us, the practical guidance from this is, do a bone day. Uh, if the person has had a fracture, there is no reason to wait for a bone density. You do a bone, get a bone density test done, but it doesn't determine your treatment uh, approach. If the person is clearly very healthy and not in that age group, etc., you need not necessarily do a bone density. But if you are part of a program where you are doing bone density, 
you have to use the bone density in the context of other risk factors. A simple osteopenia doesn't require any treatment. Bone density is minus 1.8, etc. don't require treatment. Even bone density is minus 2.4 may not require treatment. On the other hand, if the bone density is minus 1.5, the T-score, and the person has had a fracture, you would treat. Okay? So that's what I'm trying to explain. That, that uh, the message here is previous fracture very important. Risk factor is very important, like family history of fractures, smoking, low BMI. The, all those risk factors are very important. If there is prevalence of risk factors, definitely do a bone density and add it up. If, if there is clearly a low risk of fracture, you may still do a bone density. But if you do it, you have to weigh the treatment options against the fact that the person may actually be at low risk despite having a low bone density. But again, emphasizing the point, if you're confused, those with fracture treat, those without fracture get a bone density. If below 2.5, only then you will consider treatment. What treatment will you do? Uh, firstly, remember to do some tests. I'll not go through all the tests, but we have seen patients of osteoporosis starting treatment without a calcium vitamin D done. At least Uh, and, 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 and KFT. Formation. For practical purposes, we'll talk only of three drugs, bisphosphonates, denosumab, and teriparatide. Bisphosphonates and denosumab as antiresorptives and teriparatide as, as uh, anabolics or stimulators of bone formation. There are others in the pipeline, romosuzumab, abaloparatide. We're not going to talk about that today. So treatment of osteoporosis, initial treatment is by and large with bisphosphonates. That is the endocrine society guideline. And if you're using parental bisphosphonate, which most of you do, Use zolotunic acid 5 mg once a year. Reassess fracture risk using all the parameters, the clinical risk, the bone density, everything after three years. And then decide whether you want to continue that or whether you want to discontinue or whether you want to switch to something else. So there are three options. Either you stop the medicine after three years or you, or you, or you change the medicine or you stop it altogether. Uh, or you continue the same medicine. So if the, if the fracture, if the response is good and the patient falls into a safe zone after three years, you may discontinue bisphosphonates intravenous amyotropically and wait. Intravenous bisphosphonate action on bone remains for at least six to 12 months after you've discontinued. So if you do that, you, you're just setting the patient off on a bisphosphonate holiday and every year you have to monitor the patient for a change in bone density or change in bone markers. Right. If at the end of three years, so if at the end of three years, good response, patient in safe zone, you can withdraw and just follow. If at the end of three years of zoledronic acid, you find the response is dismal, it's really bad, and you're not happy, patient has had a fracture in between, nothing is going your way, then you may want to switch therapy. Then you may want to consider going to denosumab or to teriparatide, depending on your choice. If the response is fair and reasonable and the patient still falls within a high fracture risk, then you can continue zoledronic acid for another three years. Switch to a different drug. If it's a good response, but patient is still within fracture, uh, risk zone, then you can continue for another three years. The same thing applies to oral, but in oral we go straight for five years and only then we give response. Okay? So oral uh, alanine, you go straight for five years and stop and then exactly the same. 
So this is the bisphosphonate drug holiday, which, which is very controversial, let me tell you. But nevertheless, at three to five years, depending on IV or oral, you can stop the drug and follow up your patient annually if the patient is not in a high risk zone. Zoledronic acid, you know very well. I don't have to explain that. You know, it reduces hip fracture, vertebral fracture, not very remarkable molecule given just once a year. And many people are saying once in 18 months, but I stick to once a year at the moment. And the, why are you scared? I know you're scared about uh, osteonecrosis of jaw. This is osteonecrosis, a non healing wound in oral mucosa with exposed bone, with exposed bone uh, that lasts more than eight weeks and often happens after invasive uh, dental procedure, but can occur just like that. But the risk is 0.21% with more than four years of therapy. So it's really low. I mean, I wouldn't really uh, get hassled by this risk. It's a very, very low risk. So you should try and understand that uh, this is not a high risk at all. And the risk is greater of dying by uh, US data dying by murder or dying by lightning strike, uh, this risk is, is less than that or about the same. Right? So we, 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 will, uh, we should know about it, but not very excessively. But if extensive dental work has to be done, it's better to do that before you start therapy. The other risk we are all worried about, especially as orthopedic surgeons, are atypical femoral fractures. Again, look at this data. If we are using bisphosphonates in more than 45 years, which we always do, it's three per one, one lakh with two years, 20 per one lakh with five years, 20 per one lakh. And you'll be preventing so many more fractures. Right? So, and 50 per one lakh with eight years of use. So, it's really a small risk. Just remember that. So, for example, giving bisphosphonates for three years to 1,000 osteoporotic women. Prevents 100 fractures. Three years, 1,000, 100 fractures, which will include 11 hip fractures, devastating, while causing about 0.18 atypical femoral fractures. So it's not a big risk at all. Remember this. What about denosumab, the other anti resorptive, remarkable drug, alternative initial treatment for high risk patients, or can be used after teriparatide or after bisphosphonate, no drug holiday. And you go straight straight for 10 years quite easily. At five years, you can reassess fracture risk and take a call. Otherwise, you can go straight for 10 years and then take a call. So if at five years, your patient is looking really good, everything is fine, you can consider what to do. You want to move the patient to bisphosphonate. But best is to, when you start someone with denosumab, to continue straight for 10 years and then review. And when you discontinue denosumab, never do it suddenly. Like You have to add a bisphosphonate there or something there is of treatment at least. Already explained this. Uh, if you leave the denosumab in two years, the bone is really back to normal. But even in that two years, you, you actually have an increased risk of fractures. So don't discontinue denosumab. Suddenly use it only in patients who are likely to be compliant. Injections have to be given every six plus minus one month. This is denosumab available as Prolia, Olimab, etc. 60 milligrams. 60 milligrams once in six months. Right? 60 milligrams once in six months plus minus one month. That's all. Not more than seven month gap. Otherwise, you're risking your patient's uh, sort of bones uh, by increasing the risk of fracture. Yes, of course, the, we have to look at hypocalcemia, side effects of these drugs. You know the acute side effects. You know the acute side effects of zolodonic acid, uh, acute phase reaction, like a flu-like reaction. Sometimes hypocalcemia, denosumab, also hypocalcemia, but not much of acute phase reaction. And with oral uh, LN donated is uh, dysphagia and GI, upper GI problems. What about the last part of the talk, teriparatide, uh, which is a bone forming agent? And of course, you know, again, this data is 20 years old now. Bob needs a remarkable study where they showed marked reduction in vertebral fractures, new vertebral fractures. And if you look at multiple vertebral fractures, then the reduction was up to 90%. So teriparatide is an amazing drug for vertebral fractures. It probably works well for hip fractures also, but the solidity of data is maintained primarily for vertebral fractures. And it's a drug of choice often for those who undergone vertebral fractures.
the issue with teriperitine is firstly the side effects are very few, nothing. No acute phase reactions, very rare, nothing. Mild hypercalcemia, usually undiagnosed. But you give it for two years only. The anabolic agent that teriperitide is should be used for two years. Not three months, not one month, not six months. Please prescribe teriperitide for a minimum of 18 months if you're using it. One habit that we have in our country is to use teriperitide for three months, two months like that. Not a good idea. 18 months to 24 months. And follow it up with a bisphosphonate. Because once you build up the bone with the bone forming agent, you need to follow it up with a bisphosphonate that will prevent that bone loss. So you've added to the bank bone balance or the bank balance that you have to keep it there. If it's leaking out constantly, again, you will lose bone. So teriperitide will build your bone balance. And a bisphosphonate or denosumab will hold it there for you. It won't allow it to leak out again. So remember that teriperitide has to be followed by one of the anti-resorptives. Otherwise, it will leak out again the calcium. After two years, uh, give anti-resorptive. In fact, uh, you know that uh, use of denosumab actually has been shown to enhance bone density even after teriperitide. So denosumab seems to be an amazing drug to be used after any other molecule, after zoledronic acid, after teriperitide. It's amazing. Uh, first line drugs are often zoledronic acid or alendronate, or in those who have vertebral fractures, you could start with teriperitide, which is also a great option. In fact, the best effect of teriperitide is when it's taken de novo before any bisphosphonate also. It works after bisphosphonate, but it is best used when it is de novo and then bisphosphonate is added on after teriperitide. Calcium vitamin D, uh, don't go overboard with uh, vitamin D. Just try to achieve levels of 20, 30 nanograms if you want to be very cautious. But even 20 is safe. Don't try and pump in too much vitamin D and take levels to 70, 80. It doesn't help anybody. Monitoring is by bone density. I do it every year uh, in practice. When some people do it every two years, it's okay to do that. And you can monitor now. We are increasingly using bone turnover markers like bone turnover, bone resorption markers like like C-terminal telopeptide, CDX, and bone formation marker like P1NP. Bone formation marker is used for bone forming agent teriperitide. Bone resorption markers use, are used for the anti-resorptive. So if you follow them up, if you find a significant change in bone turnover markers at three months, it means your drug is working. It's, it's remarkable how sensitive these tests are now with greater ease of access and greater availability and greater accuracy of tests. And of course, for bone density, you have to see a stable or increasing bone density. The maximum increases you will see are with teriperitide. And teriperitide followed by denosumab gives maximum increases. Uh, so sometimes bisphosphonates may not show a persistent increase in BMD, some increase and then plateauing. But that doesn't mean they don't work. Their factor risk reduction is very significant, even if bone density is not changing dramatically. So we'll leave this. So finally, the last one minute, what is the choice of the drug? Somebody comes to you with a prevalent vertebral fracture. Okay, you're, you're all surgeons, most of you are surgeons. If you have a prevalent vertebral fracture patient, a good idea is to use teriperitide for two years, but followed by anti-resorptive and teriperitide for two years. If you don't want to do that, a patient doesn't want a daily shot or cost is an issue or whatever, you can use zoledronic acid intravenously once a year, once a year is standard for mine. Even the third option is very good. You can use denosumab uh, six monthly, but remember denosumab that six monthly compliance is mandatory. You can't uh, be lax with that. Or of course, good old, good old alendronate oral. Typically in my practice, but this is not a recommendation, in patients who just come with low bone density and high fracture risk, I tend to go for oral alendronate. And those who already had a fracture, I tend to go for one of these three. And the list I made is in the order of my priority, what I use. Uh, because this is actually the best bone forming agent for vertebrae, periperitide, then followed by zoledronic acid. Then, well, between these two, you can use any. Denosumab is a wonderful agent. But the problem, as I've already said, with zoledronic acid, the advantage is that it stays, the effect stays, even if you miss a go, then many of our patients are not so compliant. In denosumab, the problem, as I said, was that after six months, it escapes if you delay, delay the injection. So that's a challenge. And many, most of you deal with hip fractures, right? Is there a difference in the prioritization? You can look at this single slide, I think, which we can take home with us. 
If someone comes with a hip fracture, our first choice is olodonic acid intravenous, then denosumab, then oral alodonate, and teriparatide is the last choice. So basically, you have moved uh, moved the teriparatide down from the top to the last. Rest is same. One can definitely argue why denosumab should not be preferred over olodonic acid, and I've already given you the reason. It's about compliance, not about efficacy. Right? So, zolotonic acid is my preferred choice in this situation. If someone comes with a hip fracture, I think people who are hospitalized with you, who you're treating for a hip fracture, who you're fixing a nail, etc., etc., and making them mobile in such an amazing way that orthopedic surgeons do, you must give them a zolotonic acid before they are discharged. Don't worry about fracture really, nothing's going to happen. <clears throat> if you give them a zolotonic acid intravenous before discharge, you will find that they are protected very nicely because then compliance becomes much easier. So I think this is the way I would choose therapy uh, for my patients. If you have high risk without fracture, these are all options. Low to moderate risk without fracture, allen donate weekly is the first choice. Right? So these two slides summarize it for you. Someone who's really high risk but doesn't have a fracture, you can use a little bit as said, this my anything. Often, if the risk is not very high, I prefer to go with oral alendronate first. Even in the otherwise high risk group, you can go with oral alendronate first because efficacy wise, it's as good. The main issue is the compliance. And the main issue is that nobody takes it 52 weeks a year. And all studies have shown even the most compliant patient takes it, take it for 35, 40 weeks a year. Uh, very few take it for more than 40 weeks a year. Uh, so keeping that in mind, solid donate has become the choice in most patients. Uh, uh, putting someone at low to moderate risk without fracture on zolotonic seems a bit of overkill. So one probably puts them on a type of uh, oral uh, bisphosphate. This is how I would look at it. And that's the team. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and I'll be happy to take questions.